This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, Episode 11, for December 12th, 2008. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and unfortunately, Dick de Pommier isn't here. He's in India, but I have a wonderful crew helping me today. And Alan Dove has returned. Welcome back, Here Alan. I am. <laughs> From the hinterlands of Massachusetts. Yes, western Massachusetts that just barely missed the ice storm that's now paralyzing the rest of New England. Well, down here in New York, we had a rainstorm, and it's, we still got paralyzed. <laughs> and we're doing this early because we have a third guest who is in Europe, and that would be Jeremy Luban. Welcome, Jeremy. Thank you, Vincent. It's a pleasure to... To be in New York, uh, digitally. <laughs> and of course, everyone is joined together by the magic of Skype and the internets. <laughs> so, uh, we, we appreciate your, uh, joining us. I know the scheduling is hard. Maybe next time, maybe next time I should do it from home. Uh, we should say that Jeremy needs to, um, go back to, uh, another town in Switzerland. Do you have a six hour train ride this afternoon? Uh, yeah, something like that. That's, uh, the trains work, though, at least. Jeremy is, used to be here at Columbia, and was a colleague of mine. He's an expert in HIV and AIDS. And um, now you're at the University of Geneva? Yes. Uh, it's um, the, main, the main university for the canton of Geneva. Geneva is a canton, which is uh, roughly the equivalent of a state. Mm -hmm. And uh, Switzerland is, is a relatively small country compared to the U.S., certainly. But it has 20, I think, 26 cantons uh, packed into this little area. And Geneva is one of them. It's, it's a city, but it's also a state, sort of analogous to New York and New York. Um, and um, they're really, they're quite analogous. They're quite autonomous. They're always fighting with the, the feds. Uh, there's always a, a debate um, and a struggle for power between the states and the, the central government. Very, very similar. Sounds like you've immersed yourself in the politics already. Uh, it's very interesting here. So when you were here, I remember you uh, you had some clinical duties. You used to see patients now and then, right? That's right. Um, I, uh, in fact, went to medical school at Columbia and trained in um, internal medicine and in um, infectious diseases uh, with Harold New, who I believe was mentioned on one of your, your previous That's right. uh, podcasts. Um, and I know you have Harold New stories, right? Uh, yeah, we'll have to think of some of them. But, yeah, and so um, when you come back, if you choose to come back and we don't uh, scare you away... You could tell some Harold <laughs> New stories. I think they're very Harold interesting. New stories. Anyway, he was uh, he was a master uh, clinician who knew just about every every detail about everything there was to know about anything, uh, and was a, really an incredible clinician. And um, I think Dick was talking about. Um, I think it was in the context of the loss of fever story he mentioned. Um, Harold, I yeah, believe, was I think was Harold was. Responsible for bringing uh, Jordi Casals into the hospital here. Ah, yeah, That's yeah. what I'd heard. You may have told me that. I don't remember. Anyway. No, I didn't tell you that. Um, I also, I also heard, and I. This is, you know, who knows what's how much you you hear is true, but I, I believe he was chief resident the night that Malcolm X was uh, shot across the street and brought to Presbyterian Hospital. So they're just infinite uh, stories uh, that, uh, that Harold had. In any case, I, I trained with Harold and um, I was, while I was doing my clinical infectious disease training, I was also a postdoc with Steve Goff. Mm -hmm. uh, who's, who's my neighbor. Uh, He's right next door. Right next door, yeah. yeah. And then I uh, became a faculty, faculty member in, um, in the infectious diseases division uh, within medicine and then in the Department of Microbiology, where Vincent uh, is uh, speaking to us from right now. And I was there as a faculty member until uh, just uh, a few years ago when I made the jump across the Atlantic. 
I, I take it you don't see patients anymore. Uh... No, so I, I was uh, seeing patients at Presbyterian Hospital when I was there as an infectious disease uh, consultant or as an attending on the, the clinical services. I was a medical student in the 80s when New York was exploding with this uh, strange disease. Um, and um, there was so much of it that I remember there were clinical professors at the time who were worried that the students would not learn any medicine because um, the the process of studying uh, clinical medicine uh, is usually based on algorithms where you take a series of symptoms and you go through a checklist of possible uh, explanations for the symptoms. And um, there's kind of, uh, a kind of logic to it, and there's a, a process that uh, professors like to teach students. And in New York at that time, there was um, really huge numbers of the beds in the hospital were filled with people who were dying of AIDS, and there was very little we could do um, except throw everything at them that we had. And so there was little in the way of differential diagnosis or uh, and so professors were worried we wouldn't learn uh, the, the art of medicine. Um, and then um, in the late 80s, I guess the first drug came in about 87, AZT. Um, and that, that didn't make a big dent, but when the, the protease inhibitors came a couple of years later, the combination therapies really transformed uh, what medicine could do for HIV positive people and in a very suddenly in a matter of years the the hospital beds really emptied out and it became primarily an outpatient disease uh, which is not to say that it's it's not still a deadly disease and a, a dreadful one so you were you were here at the very beginning I had forgotten about that so you have a unique perspective and perhaps uh, another episode you could recount those early years and what it was like in some yeah, detail. Yeah, it was it a pretty, pretty interesting uh, period. Um, it's, um, in many ways, it was, um, it resembled what, what the situation is in, in many other parts of the world today. Uh, How so? Uh, in terms of the, uh, the huge effect, the huge numbers of, of sick people, of the effect of seeing young people dying uh, in such numbers, um, the the impact that it had on the uh, the healthcare system. Um, you know, it's you see pictures uh, today of say uh, uh, parts of South Africa where there there are huge numbers of HIV infected people, and um, it's um, people. A lot of people forget that, that New York also was, was uh, in many ways, resembled that at the time. Last week, we um, talked very briefly about a story that had come out originally in, in Lancet and which was picked up by many news organizations, this idea that one could start very early testing for HIV in Africa and then treat immediately with antiretrovirals and maybe eliminate the disease in 10 years. Right. Um, and now that you're here with us, Jeremy, what are your thoughts about that? I'm sure you you saw that. I think as far as, certainly as far as a mathematic, mathematical model, it's very interesting. Um, the, but there's so many, there's so many levels to, to the problem that they go way beyond, uh, go way beyond that and that are unpredictable and are hard to uh, encode in a, in, in any kind of formula, um, in um, one of the interesting things in New York, um, and again I talk about New York because that's where I, I was practicing medicine. Um, one of the interesting um, problems for clinicians working in hospitals during the '80s um, was that even when uh, tests were available, that is to diagnose infection. Uh, we often couldn't could not use them because um, there was great concern about uh, protecting the patients, the patients' rights, protecting them from being ostracized or um, um, otherwise blocked from receiving care or 
uh, getting fired from their jobs or, or whatever, uh, all kinds of things that are, are, are clearly important and obvious. But in many ways, um, physicians' hands were often tied because they, they were required to get consent from the patient to get these tests, and, and often people uh, did not want to be tested. And this, I think, is a, is a very common uh, situation. And um, that was in New York. Um, I I would imagine that uh, when you you go to you go to other places, you go to places where people have other other ideas, uh, other world views uh, than we know in the United States. Uh, it becomes even more complicated. So there are all kinds of legal issues with with this whole business of testing, of universal testing. Uh, there are all kinds of issues of of the rights of the patient, of the individual, um, and um, you know it's one thing when, and even it's even debatable when you have a, an infectious disease that that spreads readily person to person through the air. Um, it's hard enough. Um, to, to deal with the legal issues there of confinement of, um, say, people with uh, viruses that are spread through the air that, that might be dangerous, like SARS, for example. Um, but HIV isn't, isn't uh, so readily spread, and it's a little bit more tricky um, imposing rules on people about, um, about what is done with their, their bodies and their futures. Well, the uh, main thing I wanted to talk about with you today is this paper which came out, uh, I think, last week in the journal uh, Immunity, and which has been picked up in the press. And we should note that not every scientific paper is picked up in the press, and uh, only if they have some great impact. And this one is called Lytic Granule Loading of CD8-Positive T-Cells is required for HIV-infected cell elimination associated with immune control. Uh, so that's a, a mouthful probably for a number of our uh, listeners. So can you tell us what this is about, Jeremy? Why is it important? So the, the paper um, is, is very impressive for, for a number of reasons. Um, um, uh, just on face value, it's impressive because of the the incredible uh, collection of authors. It's a it's a big group effort, um, and it's it's really a huge effort that involves uh, resources that have been developed over many years. Uh, when I say resources, I mean uh, specific techniques, but I also mean um, institutions like. Um, uh, programs at the the National Institutes of Health that have been developed to um, to study uh, diseases like this. So um, the study involves a collection of a of a large group, uh, relatively large group. And when I say large, um, I'm trying to remember what the number is. Maybe it's 30 people or 20. Uh, who are who have the remarkable property that they are infected with HIV, um, but somehow their bodies are their body is able to control the virus. That is the 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 virus is present in their body, but it's it's seems to be uh, replicating at a very low level, and the. The belief is that it's replicating at a low level because it's being suppressed actively by um, some sort of potent uh, immune mechanism that these people possess. So these are pretty rare people, and when I say they're suppressing virus, um, I, I mean that um, in many cases you can't detect the virus in their blood, and to find it you have to go through extraordinary measures to find it, like removing lymph nodes and putting them into culture systems. Um, it also, I think the average person in this cohort has been HIV infected for 17 years. Wow. Um, which is a very long time to be HIV infected and to be alive. And these people also, uh, you need to remember, are not taking drugs that inhibit the virus. So, um, something spontaneously uh, is controlling the virus, something within their bodies. 
these are these are people are called um, these are the so-called uh, elite controllers or non-progressors, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And you said there were how rare is is this on a numbers basis? Do you know? I don't I don't know frequency numbers, but it's way off the curve, and I don't know that any kind of frequency number would be accurate because they're so rare. Okay. Um, they're they're really they're unusual people who who walk off the street into a clinic one day and say what's going on. <laughs> so why why are they ever detected? Do they feel ill at some point or because you know the initial disease is not HIV specific. Well, they're, are they, they're antibody positive, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. These people are all positive by the so-called AIDS test, which is a, a measure of antibodies against the virus. But why would they be tested if they don't feel ill? Um, the first such cohort that I was aware of uh, was in New York. Uh, big coincidence. Um, and um, this cohort was about 20 people. And these were people, the, the typical person in this cohort was someone who was um, living in a community of people where, where AIDS was very common. Some of these individuals had uh, pretty much all of their acquaintances die, um, not just get sick, but die of AIDS. Um, in the course of all this, they, uh, they had been tested because all their friends were positive and they were uh, exposed to the virus uh, because of uh, sexual activity with, with uh, in, in many cases, multiple people who were positive. And so these people were um, struck <laughs> very obviously by the fact that they were alive and all their friends were dead. Um, and they wanted to know why. And so, uh, for example, some of them just uh, contacted research centers and said, what, uh, what's, what's going on? Uh, someone needs to find out. Um, and um, one, one of the, the first really interesting uh, things that came, I mean, these, these people, uh, you, you can imagine, are, are considered kind of a goldmine for, for scientists, um, for people who want to develop a vaccine and, and ask, why can't we do it? Uh, and what special the the obvious question is why are these people so special? What do they have? What what does their immune system do? And everyone believes it's their immune system controlling the virus. Um, there must be some important clues there. So out of the first this first cohort I was talking about, um, maybe twenty people, it was discovered that two of them had a mutation. Two of the people had a mutation in a gene that encodes a protein that HIV needs to enter cells. And this is the CCR5 uh, protein that, that HIV uh, uses to fuse into uh, CD4 positive uh, T cells. So the, two of these people had deletion uh, in the gene that encodes the protein, and so the protein was non-functional. And these people were, uh, because of this mutation, um, relatively resistant uh, to the virus. Um, um, there were other people who didn't have this mutation, and um, clearly um, we would like to know why these other people were uh, protected from, uh, from getting disease. Um, the CCR5 mutation, it turns out, does make you relatively resistant to getting infected, uh, but if you are infected, um, it's, it makes it much easier for your body to control the virus. Let's see, where were we? <laughs> we wanted, so it's great to study these patients because you might learn. Yeah. And I might add that so many HIV vaccines have failed that these patients, I think, give hope that we can still do something because they are disease-free, so there must be a way. Right. Yeah. So what is different about the uh, elite controllers in terms of the immune response? Well, I guess bef before we get to the to the paper, I think if I just tell if I just say what's in the paper, it's it's not quite as um as clear what its significance is if you don't understand the context. And I, I think the context really is important. And the kind of general context that's important to think about is that um HIV seems to be different than other viruses. Um, the immune response to it seems to be different. 
And the way it interacts with the body seems to be different than, say, a virus like polio. And attempts to make vaccines against HIV based on concepts derived from other viral infections like polio virus, um, those, those attempts have failed. And um, I think, for me, this is really the most interesting question about HIV and AIDS. That is why... Um, well, another detail here, um, almost everyone who becomes infected with HIV uh, mounts what, what would be considered uh, by any standard measures, standard as far as other viruses are concerned, mount, um, most people mount an effective immune response. That is, they, they uh, elicit, the virus elicits antibodies and cytotoxic T cells that will kill HIV-infected cells. And the immunity is effective in that you can see the viral load actually reduced in response to these immune, immune parameters. That is, um, initially you become infected, you have a lot of virus in your blood uh, circulating in your body. And with a predictable time course, anti-HIV antibodies appear and cytotoxic T cells appear. And in particular, in correlating with the appearance of these cytotoxic T cells, uh, the viremia decreases. The amount of virus goes, goes down. And these are, these are big reductions in most, most everyone who's infected. Then the virus has, has some tricks that have been identified that allow it to maybe sneak around to escape from the antibodies. The, that's a whole story in itself. But um, most people are able to, to bring the viremia down uh, considerably from what it was when they first became infected and keep it at some relatively stable level uh, for many years, maybe 10 years on average. And then, for some reason, and this is the this is the real mystery. At some point, um, the immune system no longer controls the virus. The virus replication picks up, and the destruction that it causes um, um, eliminates elements of the immune system that are needed to control other infections. And then, uh, when people die, they're not dying from HIV directly. Usually, they're dying from um, the inability of the damaged immune system to control these other infections. So the real mystery is why in the face of what we would consider an effective immune response as, as, um, as measured by uh, CD8 cells that kill HIV-infected cells in almost everyone you look at, why in the face of this... Uh, are people not able to control the virus? Um, and what these long-term non-progressors or um, uh, elite controllers give us is a window on what it might mean for a person to control the virus with their immune system. Um, it's been known for a while, there are many, many experiments that indicate that CD8 cells are important for, for the control of the virus. Um, so, for example, there are some animal models uh, with viruses like HIV, not exactly HIV, but cousins, and uh, the viremia in these, in these animal models is controlled by CD8. So, if you, you eliminate the CD8 cells, you can see the, the viremia increase uh, very drastically, and then if the CD8s return, the viremia drops. There are many ex experiments like this, and there's a lot of evidence from HIV-infected people that CD8s are important for controlling the virus. Um, it was clear that there, was, there have been hints over the years that the CD8 cells in the long-term non-progressors have some special properties. And it's been very hard to pin that down. Um, there are some studies that have suggested uh, the CD8 cells in these people um, have a broader repertoire. That is, they, they're able to attack more sites on the virus than the CD8s in other people. There are some studies that suggest that the cells um, are more abundant. 
Um, and it's been very hard to tease apart these different things. So um, from our understanding of it, you need, first of all, you need these CD8 killer cells that, um, at a certain level. Um, they need to persist in the body for, for the lifetime, certainly the lifetime of the infection. They need to be able to proliferate these cells. They need to be able to expand and they need to become activated in response to the, the viral antigens. And then they need to be able to recognize virally infected cells and kill them. And the killing involves transfer of granules of uh, toxic proteins from the cytotoxic T cells to the, the infected target cells. And what there are many, many questions in, in the field about the cells in these long-term non-progressors, why they were special. So to give you an example of one very interesting question that was addressed in this paper, um, it's known that the levels, the, the numbers of these cells that are circulating in a person, or at least it's been believed, are regulated by the amount of virus that's present in the body. So for example, if there's a lot of virus, there's a lot of antigen, there's a lot of stimulus for the cells to grow, proliferate, and expand, and therefore you have more of them. And so it's been noticed in, um, in the, more, the more frequent type of HIV-infected person who doesn't control the virus, um, that they have a relatively high level of viremia. Um, and then if they're given a drug that um, prevents the virus from replicating and the viremia goes down, um, it's been observed often that the, the numbers of the CD8 cells go down along with it. Um, and then when the drugs are moved and the virus goes up, the, the CD8s proliferate again in response to antigen. So this study took a relatively large group of these long-term non-progressors and compared them uh, side by side with people who are HIV infected and then People uh, people who are HIV infected but are not such controllers. They progress. They have they have AIDS basically, right? Well, they they're progressors. They, let's they say they may not have AIDS, but they they um, the they disease is have, progressing in them. The th theoretically, the disease is progressing. Almost certainly, it's progressing. Um, what is known is that the the levels of the virus replication are high in these people, okay. which is what you see in most people, right? Um, and the assumption is what uh, disease progression correlates with the magnitude of virus replication. So um, um, then they took people who were in the same category, the, the more common HIV-infected people, but who were taking uh, drug therapy that inhibits the viremia. And so they, they had nice controls there to compare the the frequencies of these cells in these different kinds of populations, um, looking at that one particular variable. And ultimately, what they found is that when they, they take the CD8s from the long-term non-progressors, each individual cell uh, seems to be a more effective killer than uh, the cells from the other patients. When they put they normalize everything in terms of the levels of the viremia, the numbers of the cells, um, and then use um, brand very, very uh, state-of-the-art assays for transfer of granules from one cell to another. There are all kinds of very interesting technical details to this paper. Um, and that, that underlines all kinds of other, other issues we could talk about, like the importance of basic research for this important clinical issue. Um, this paper is is a collection of of enormous amounts of of information that have been acquired from basic scientists, um, and wouldn't have been possible without that. Um, in the end, what they find is that the the CD8s from the long term non progressors are very each one each cell is able to deliver a very uh, large. Uh, amount of these toxic granules to uh, the HIV-infected target cells. And the cells from progressors were not as effective at doing that. Exactly. How about the, the people who were on drug therapy? What was the result with them? 
it, it's it's the same. That is, if they so these people might have lower they might have lower numbers of the cells because the cells aren't proliferating in response to the virus. So the cells in these people are more dependent on the virus to maintain their numbers than are the cells in the long-term non-progressors. But even if they they normalize numbers of cells from all of them and look on a per cell basis, the the effectiveness of the long-term non-progressor CD8s is, is much higher. In the drug-treated people, so it's higher than the, the progressors who are not treated? N- no, basically the segregation is just between the, long, the long-term the long non-progressors are, are uniquely uh, more potent than anybody else's cells. Got it. Whether you're on <laughs> uh, whether drugs they're or they're drug-treated yeah. or not. Okay. It's not how many CD8s you have, it's how well they're working. Well, it's the number is clearly important, um, but um, but the, um, the the most the most striking uh, thing that separates these long term non progressors from from either of the other groups who are who have the the regular run of the mill immune response uh, is that those cells that they have are much more potent. Right. And there's another little detail at the end, which is, um, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe a, little more, uh, a little more controversial in some, on some levels, which is that they're able to take the CD8s from the non-long-term non-progressors, the progressor people. They're able to take CD8s from them, and by giving them... Uh, substances that activate signaling pathways known to be important for T cell function. Specifically, this is PMA and ionomycin, the chemicals they give. They're able to elevate the killing uh, strength of the CD8s um, in these people as well. So, the implication, what they, what the authors uh, suggest, is that it may be that there could be a way to increase the killing potential of the cells in the the average HIV infected person. Why is that? Why is that uh, controversial? Well, I think it's it's a little to some extent it's a little artificial what they did. Um, they um, they they hit the cells with uh, with a real sledgehammer. <laughs> Uh, in effect, that's the, that's the the concern that I have. So this is not something you would give a patient these two no, compounds, right? No, 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 right? no way. I guess you could imagine you would do things in vitro and then put the cells back in people, but it's. Uh, are, they, are these toxic? Is that the problem? To, if you give them, to yeah, people? they would infinite numbers of infinite problems with giving these directly to people. So maybe one could find a, a chemical which didn't have the toxicity but had sure. the same effect. So right? they. The the positive thing about it is that well maybe maybe it is um, so they did a comparison they they used these drugs and they also used a more um, again artificial but much more physiologic stimulation of the cells stimulating the T cell receptors and a co-receptor on the T cells with antibodies this is considered more physiologic and that did not work. And I guess one question is whether um, it didn't work because it is a weaker stimulus uh, compared to the drugs or whether there's something qualitatively different about it. And the one interpretation, uh, which is the certainly optimistic one uh, and may be true, is, is that the two stimuli are qualitatively different and that's, that's why uh, one was effective and the other wasn't. So it could be that, I mean, the hope is that there might be a way to develop a specific um, substance, um, some that would, um, you know, something you could eat <laughs> that would stimulate uh, just the right way so that these cells were. Mm, they, yeah, they also suggest that maybe a vaccine would have this property of in, of inducing cells that rapidly expand. Although I don't know how you would, you know design such a vaccine but that would be that would be it's one thing you could assay in uh, in vaccine trials for example right well so one one of the problems with vaccine trials is that we don't we don't know 
we don't know very well what parameters to follow in people to know if the vaccine's working or not. So we don't know what uh, endpoints to shoot for. Um, and using conventional endpoints uh, hasn't worked. And that's uh, so, you know, it's not like the vaccine trials that have been done have been um, silly or, I mean, some might argue that, but um, the they were, it, everything was done sensibly. It's just that this is a different problem that we're dealing with and we don't we don't know enough about um about how to attack this virus well i presume one could look at granule transfer for example in vaccinees although it may be not easy to do well that's that's that is that is one really important aspect of a study like this um is that you you now um, for example, some some very smart person somewhere might read this paper and say, oh, I, I want to study this. And they might develop some sort of experimental system uh, involving vaccination and eliciting uh, cells that transfer granules. And they would follow granule transfer as their endpoint rather than does a cell make a particular cytokine that turns out maybe isn't useful. Um, which is what has been done in the past. So um, just having this information available now could transform um, how someone in any location on the planet <laughs> who's doing vaccine research um, might think about how they do their experiments. And through this kind of information, uh, someone might uh, find a a way to vaccinate or a substance to give with the vaccine or something that people can eat when they get the vaccination, who knows, that would alter the response to the vaccine such that they would um, not just have more CD8s that are specific for HIV, but that they have CD8s specific for HIV that transfer granules efficiently. So this information uh, is extremely valuable. It's taken years and years and years of work by many, many people. And that's, that's really evident from, from the paper. And um, I think people have to understand that that's, that's how it works. Yeah, sure, <laughs> especially in, a, in something like this that's affecting many people and there's a lot of impetus to, to do things. You get a lot of people involved. I think yeah. it's an incredibly impressive uh, paper that the techniques are are just state of the art. It's a it's a real technical tour de force. Yeah, amazing. I, we will put the link to it in the show notes. I encourage you to uh, listeners to have a look at this. This is quite awesome, and we uh, enjoy your interpretation of it, Jeremy. It was good. Anything else before we move on to next, uh, Jeremy? Do you want to stay with us a bit, or uh, as we move to other viruses? Or we... I think unfortunately I have to run. Um... Don't fall. But I, I hope uh, I'll try not to fall, and I hope to come back again. And um, you know, I'm not sure it's true that viruses are not alive. I'm not. I don't buy that interpretation. <laughs> um, I'm referring to a comment that Vincent made on a previous uh, first podcast. episode. First episode. Yeah, absolutely. First episode. So I'm happy oh, to I, talk I, about. I need that. a couple of beers before I start discussing that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell anyway. you, look, I've heard people uh, wonder if viruses have sex. Okay, so. At least uh, we're a little more realistic. But we can talk well, about that in, in the future. It's recombination sex, I don't yeah. know. Uh, no, I mean male or female type yeah. designations. But anyway, uh, come back sometime. We're, we're glad you, you joined us. Join TWIV and uh, come back another time. Okay, thank you so much. All right, have, a really safe, it. have a safe trip. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. All right. That is a very interesting paper. I'm glad Jeremy was able to do that. Um yeah, and, it was uh, great to hear from him. We will we will have him back. I'd like to hear his stories about the early days of AIDS in uh, in New York. Uh, that could be interesting, don't you think, uh, Alan? Yeah, absolutely. That's a that's a neat little bit of history there. I mean, I was I was in New York starting in 1990, but I wasn't uh, certainly wasn't involved in any of the clinical aspects. Um, right. Neither so. I. Neither I. I forgot to t ask Jeremy uh, where we could find him, but we'll we'll find a website and put it on the uh, in the show notes so people can go look at his work. Absolutely. Jeremy Luban. Uh, we have uh, perhaps two other news stories that we'll go over before we get to reader email. 
we've switched around the, the order of the show because we wanted to have Jeremy have the opportunity to join us. The second paper is also very interesting, and I wish Dick were here because this is up his alley. It, absolutely, yeah. Because <laughs> it deals with viruses and mosquitoes. And this is a paper published uh, not too long ago in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences called Alpha Virus Derived Small RNAs Modulate Pathogenesis in Disease Vector Mosquitoes. And as everyone knows, many virus infections are transmitted in mosquitoes, and we've talked about a few of them on this show, West Nile, Yellow Fever, Dengue. But most often, the mosquito is fine. It has virus in it, but it doesn't get sick. Uh, if they died, they would be less effective at, at transmitting the disease. Right. And this is not something that has been uh, understood very well. Um, it's just been assumed, I think, that mosquitoes are persistently infected and uh, have, have evolved with the virus and therefore aren't harmed by it. But this paper provides a specific mechanism for this. These, these authors find that when mosquitoes are infected with a model virus, Synbis virus, which is a mosquito-borne virus frequently studied in the laboratory, the mosquitoes, uh, the cells basically break up the viral genome into small pieces of interfering RNAs, resembling the small interfering RNAs uh, uh, found in cells. And that these then, this then inhibits viral replication. So the virus comes into the mosquito cell. It's degraded by the same machinery that produces uh, siRNAs in cells, and that in some way prevents viral replication. We don't, as far as I can tell from the paper, they really don't know the mechanism of inhibition. Right. All right. It could be degradation of the RNA. It could be an innate response against the small RNA fragments, but uh, we don't really know. So this is presumed to be protective, and what they do is they interfere with this mechanism, this degradation of the uh, of the genome into small RNA pieces, and that makes the mosquitoes die and more sick. So they think that this could be a nice target for uh, interfering with viral repli or viral transmission in mosquitoes. And they have a very interesting discussion where they talk about how to use this. And I thought that was actually a very nice part of the paper, where they say that uh, you, know, you, you would have to reduce virus replication to zero to prevent transmission in mosquitoes. So maybe yes. a better way would be to uh, increase it so that you, the, the mosquito basically gets sick, right? Right. And so you could interfere with this uh, inhib inhibitory pathway in the mosquito, right? And you get more virus replication, as they've shown in the paper, and, and the mosquitoes die. Of course, the problem is you've got to um, then somehow get that trait propagated through the whole mosquito population when it would be pretty strongly selected against. Exactly, yes. They say if you do anything to the mosquito to make them less fit, it's going to be selected against. Right. That's, that's what evolution does. And in fact, we don't know how we would get it into the mosquito population, right? I mean, you, you well, there's been there's actually been a little bit of work on that. Um, people uh, obviously they start with fruit flies, and mosquitoes are another um, another fly, same order. Um, so you can you can obviously genetically engineer fruit flies, um, and then you can develop various traits that will that will allow your inserted gene to be transmitted. Um, uh, you know, through the germ line of that mosquito line, the trick really, as we're getting at, is that uh, you you need to get the trait propagated through a whole population. You need some kind of uh, some kind of positive selection. Maybe give the give the mosquito some other advantage to compensate for this big disadvantage that you're giving it with the with the virus replication. So, what would you if you were able to identify a, a way of modifying the mosquito? How could you propagate that in nature? Well, there's a there's actually a great precedent for this from about 50 years ago. Um, uh, there's a, a guy, um, his name is Nippling, um, who developed a technique. It's called the sterile insect technique, mm -hmm. and he developed this as a as an insect control method. Um, so what they do is breed a bunch of um, let's say uh, flies. You take a bunch of flies that you want to eliminate from nature. Um, and uh, you set up a breeding facility, you breed a bunch of them, you select out um, 
the males. So you, you kill off the females, you select out only males, then you expose them to some chemical or, or radioactive um, insult that sterilizes them. Then you release these sterile males into nature, and they go out and they breed with females, and in a lot of insect species, including a lot of flies, mating occurs only once. Mm -hmm. So the females mate with these sterile males, and they lay eggs that'll never hatch. Um, you do that, now obviously you've got a population of billions and billions of flies out there, so you release your tiny little population of sterile males, and they mate with some females, and, and that has a little bit of an effect on the population. But if you keep doing this year after year, you will eventually whittle the insect population down. Um, and in fact, this was proven, um, proven effective. There used to be a nasty parasite of cattle called screwworm, um, which is a rather evocative name. It's a, <laughs> um, it's a fly that causes um, what's called furuncular myiasis. It, uh, um, it bites uh, into the skin or finds a wound in the skin of a cow lays its egg in that it, its eggs in that wound and then as the eggs hatch the maggots actually eat their way out through the flesh of the cow and that's how they nourish themselves and then they hatch out as flies so as you can imagine this makes the cow very sick it it damages the hide it decreases the meat quality it's a really bad thing for the cattle industry and nippling and his colleagues um actually got a program going using the sterile insect technique and they eradicated completely eradicated um, screwworm flies from the United States so this is no longer an agricultural pest mm -hmm. so that's kind of the model of the way you would propagate something like this um, you would maybe insert a gene into you genetically modify your males and then you'd release them and you get more and more genetically modified individuals in the population mm -hmm. um, but the issue, of course, is if you've got some trait that you're now adding and, sure. and putting in there that's going to be selected against, um, then those flies are going to die out rather than uh, Yeah, rather than I, I think that's always going to be an issue because we don't really know what to do to, to have a neutral trait put in them, right? Right. And so I suspect just, just as when you try and modify a virus to – be more or less pathogenic, it's very easy to lose those traits. Right. Evolution will push it back towards the center. Yep. And as we've said before, we're not smart enough to outsmart evolution. Probably <laughs> never will be, at least in terms of viruses and mosquitoes. So That's right. uh, this, is a, this is a very interesting one. And I should, should point out just before we end up here that this has been shown in Drosophila flies, of course, which are used in the laboratory, that you can... Uh, that this happens, this uh, production of small RNAs occurs when uh, various viruses infect flies and it uh, leads to knockdown of viral replication. Right. So it has been shown in other systems. So uh, the re this is the re one of the reasons why maybe uh, mosquitoes don't get sick. Now, I don't know how general it is. Of course, one would have to look in different mosquitoes and in different virus infections, but that will happen. Sure. And this paper will stimulate that kind of work. And uh, given the importance of mosquito-borne infections, I think it obviously it needs to be done. Absolutely. That's uh, one of the top causes of death in the world still. Yeah. The, the last story is one that you liked. Why don't you uh, take the lead on this one, neuroviruses? Yeah. So I, I follow a lot of different news feeds, of course, um, following um, what's going on in science reporting. And norovirus is interesting to me because it's one of these things that um, it's always there. Uh, you know, there's a, I think the CDC estimate is that half of all outbreaks of foodborne illness, when somebody says, oh, I got food poisoning from those deli sandwiches, no, about 50% right, huh? of the time, <laughs> that's, that's actually a norovirus hmm. in the surveys that they've done. Um, so this is something that's just always there in the background, but then it makes the headlines sporadically. Uh, you'll get an outbreak. Uh, this is most famous on cruise ships. Right. You get an outbreak on a cruise ship, and uh, you know everybody has to get off the ship, and they go th go around and they try and disinfect everything. Um, but in fact, the more common outbreaks that you get are in places like nursing homes and. Um, uh, restaurants, catered events, um, universities. So there was, now there was one yes, of these and is a university. universities. So there were, there were these two stories, uh, almost back to back, um, 
on different outbreaks of norovirus. One of them was uh, in Indianapolis uh, at Butler University, um, where apparently they had about 200 people um, get sick from norovirus. And uh, uh, I, I thought that one of the public health officials um, you know, even commented, it's your common cruise ship kind of scenario. <laughs> There's a higher risk for a norovirus where there are large groups of people around each other for a long period of time. So he's even, uh, you know, citing cruise ships as the example. It's um, probably originated from a food handler, right, who's infected. Yes. Shedding all, virus probably doesn't have symptoms because there are asymptomatic infections. And That's uh, right. About a third of the people who get this are going to be asymptomatic. Um, and the people who are just about to come down with it are probably shedding virus. And people who just got over it are probably mm. shedding virus. So you right. get a food handler who didn't want to take an extra day off work and they go in, you know, they're mostly over the virus, but they still have, they still have some of it on their hands. Um, and they don't wash their hands adequately after they use the bathroom or what have you. That's and what those signs are for in the, in the restrooms and restaurants. That's right. All employees must wash hands. I don't think they do. And, uh, you know, with norovirus, the issue is that it's extremely infectious. You can get, uh, just a few particles and, yeah. and that'll, give you That's the disease. Uh, amazing. A few particles is enough to infect an individual. Yes. They're saying 50% of all foodborne outbreaks of gastroenteritis can be attributed to noroviruses. When I, when I used to teach this uh, virus to medical students, they always got a kick out of the, the other name, winter vomiting disease. Which is the other story that I saw on the BBC, and it's just a really, really brief little uh, slug article that they've got. It's a bunch of wards at a hospital were closed out following an outbreak of winter vomiting virus. It's evocative, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> I used to tell the medical students, uh, your body is unhappy. It's, it's trying to get rid of things from both ends. Nothing That's worse, right. vomiting and diarrhea altogether. Have you ever had uh, what you thought might be a norovirus infection? Alan? I, in retrospect, yeah, I think I did. Um, it's it's certainly common enough, and I I've had a couple of foodborne things that you know you could look back at a particular meal and say yeah, yeah that would that have been a it. good place to pick it up. I, I had it I had it a f number of years ago. I used to get a lot of infections. My when my kids were young, they would bring it back from school. Right. And this was really nasty. It lasted twenty four hours, vomiting, diarrhea, really feeling very bad, and the. The thing about this is you can get it again because there are many serotypes and uh, immunity doesn't cross-protect. Right. So it could happen again. We should point out that these are uh, RNA viruses, positive strand RNA viruses with icosahedral capsids. Yeah. And uh, they're called Noro because one of the original viruses was Norwalk virus from Norwalk, Ohio. That's right. And I think Dick said in a previous show that the people in Norwalk were not happy that this virus were na was named after them, so yes. they changed it to norovirus. <laughs> but many of them are very difficult to grow in cell culture, very hard to study. There are mouse noroviruses that can be grown and studied, but the, the human ones are difficult for reasons that people haven't sorted out yet. Yeah. So making things like making a vaccine is, is, is far off because we haven't yet sorted out a lot of issues, like how to grow right. it. <laughs> how, how to grow it is pretty fundamental. And then also you'd need uh, however many dozens and dozens of serotypes. Yeah, um, so that's, I don't order. think that's clear yet. So it's another example where we need some more work on these. And uh, Absolutely. Uh, you know, it's not like the, the amount of work being done on it doesn't approach the scale of uh, AIDS, of course. Right. But it's still important. It debilitates people, and it's economically important. So, uh, Sure. It well, if you figure done. 23 million cases of people who probably missed work for a few days over this, it's... Mm -hmm. uh, it adds up. That's adding up to an auto bailout. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, those of you who are thinking about a career in virology, there's plenty to do. And you'll, if you keep listening to TWIV, you'll, you'll, you'll get that message. Yep. Right. And get plenty of ideas on what you can work on. I had a couple of interesting uh, reader emails uh, I'd like to go over. and uh, Sure. Then we'll wrap it up. So first of all, there was one from Jens who said he, he has been listening to our podcast since the first episode. Yeah, I have two comments about the elephant herpes viruses mentioned in the last episode. I think you were mistakenly saying that EEHVs are gamma herpes viruses. 
and therefore related to human CMV. Yeah, I made a mistake. It's a, yep. it's a beta. Sorry. <laughs> I get very excited about these viruses and I misspeak. Second, you were mentioning that EEHVs encoded TK, which would make it possible to treat the disease with chain terminators. But human CMV, another beta herpes virus, is treatable with these like gancyclovir because they have a protein, UL97, that is uh, able to phosphorylate the drug. And that's absolutely right. You can use these chain terminators with uh, beta herpes viruses because they, they don't have a TK, but they can they have another protein that can phosphorylate the drugs. So you're right on both counts. Thanks very much for pointing it out. Um, I'm, I'm very happy that the readers are engaged and they, they're listening and telling us things. That's great. So People we, are paying attention, yes. Yeah, we, we appreciate it. Now, in a related email, Chris from Canada, who's a frequent commenter, uh, commented on the elephant uh, story, and he said, it's a good reason not to have pets. But, you know, this brings up a, a very interesting issue. I am a member of a list serve, an email uh, list from the Mammalian Biology Group, and basically a list serve is such, you send an email to it, and it goes to everyone who's subscribed. You probably right. remember those from the old days, Alan. Oh, sure. Right. I, I have still subscribed to a couple of them. So I, I've subscribed to one because I'm, I'm interested in getting mouse specimens. And recently, um, someone is doing a survey about people who trap mice. And I'm amazed. Some of these individuals have been trapping mice for over 40 years. And he, one of them said, I've trapped thousands of mice and I don't take any precautions. They don't, <laughs> they don't wear gloves or anything. <laughs> I was amazed at that because, as you know, there are pathogens in mice. Um, hantavirus comes to hantavirus mind. Hantavirus in the urine. So if the mice, if you get the mice and mouse and it pees on you, you have to be careful, guys. Which so, it always does. <laughs> and, you know, you can, the fact that you've done it for 40 plus years simply means that you've been lucky. Right. Right. It's going to happen. Or maybe you have a very robust immune system. Hmm. Okay, our next email is from Matt, who said uh, he had just listened to all the podcasts. They're very enjoyable and informative. Great when working alone in the lab on the weekend. <laughs> a good idea. Yeah. The reason I'm writing is in relation to the comment Dr. De Pommier made about quarantine. Well, I don't... Um, I don't normally do this. I felt this information was too interesting not to relate. Dr. De Pommier mentioned that quarantine was first used in the control of yellow fever, but I am sure that he knows that quarantine was first established by the Venetians in the 1100s during one of the bubonic plague epidemics. They instituted a policy known as quarantenaria, a 40-day isolation. There you go, 40, applied to all incoming vessels. So he remembers this from a course in medical history. So he thought it would be interesting for our listeners to hear this. And I agree. Um, I hadn't known that, but I asked Dick about it, and he said, yes, you're, he's right. I had forgotten about that. It was first uh, the Venetians who instituted quarantine. you know about that, uh, Alan? Uh, I had heard about that, and there are also um, there are some examples. I think there was a um, – this came up during one of the outbreaks of something, and I wish I remember what, in Africa. It might have been one of the Ebola outbreaks um, where it turned out that one – one tribe in the area seemed pretty unaffected by it, and then somebody investigated, and they found out they had this long, long tradition, this traditional belief that if somebody developed some really bad illness, you were supposed to um, effectively quarantine them. They, they had this whole ritual around it. They'd put them in a hut, and they would isolate them. They would deliver food and water, but they would have no other contact with them for some period of time. It, heck, it might even have been 40 days. But um, mm. and, they, and it, was, it was very obvious that they had, their culture had evolved their own quarantine procedure, and they had implemented it, and it was actually insulating them from this, this modern outbreak. So this is a concept that seems to have come up uh, multiple times in history. Of course, it depends on the disease. It may or may not be effective, as we've talked about. Right, With, exactly, you know, if, if you, you have something at, persistent. Yeah, if you don't have symptoms... Uh, all the time, then you're not going to end up quarantining everyone, which was the case with polio. Right. Or a mosquito-borne infection, putting them in a hut is not going to help. Exactly. Yeah. So he thought we should, in another episode, discuss the history of disease uh, as it impacts modern practices, which is a great idea. Sure. And, uh, we'll, we'll wait for Dick, because he's the historian. Maybe you are also, Alan. 
I know a little bit of it, but okay. Dick is definitely the guy to go to on so that. So he said the podcasts are fantastic. Keep up the great work, and I'm sure everyone will continue to listen. And that's great. Thanks very much, Matt. And the last comment uh, for today is from Daniela. Hi, Dick and Vincent. I want to let you know I really love and appreciate your podcast. Also, I have a question. You said all diseases originally began as animal diseases. If that's the case, I was wondering where, what the original animal reservoirs were for the diseases that harbor no animal reservoir today, such as polio, and why how the disease died out in the non-human population. It's a fantastic question. Yes. Probably we don't have time to do it justice but basically i the, the issue is the following all well, viruses probably evolved many many millions of years ago along with the first life and if you want to learn more about that i suggest looking at our textbook um, there's a very nice chapter on evolution and then since then and since animals were around before humans or non animal non human animals were around before us they were the first to be infected and then when we appeared we got infections from animals and so any new viruses that we acquire over the years, including today, is, is an animal infection or a zoonosis. And in some cases, we still can find or we think we can find the virus in animals. So, for example, uh, measles is believed to have originated from a related virus of cows, rinderpest virus. Maybe about five, uh, 11,000 years ago when we began to, uh, sorry, 5,000 years ago when we began to first Domesticate. Uh, domesticate cattle, and you get the virus from them. And there are a number of other examples. Smallpox may have come from a gerbil, in fact. And those viruses are still in the animals, or related viruses. But there are some, like polio, which probably originated from an animal, uh, and it's no longer in the animal. We have no evidence that polio virus is in any species except humans, uh, so it may have died out in the animal. Um, we're not sure the origin of polio, as we we speculate for for a number of viruses where they came from, but for polio, we don't know. And there are many picornaviruses that infect animals, but I've not seen any suggestion of that polio originated from any of them or a precursor to, to any of them. So it's just the case that, in, that some uh, infections die out. Maybe the species becomes extinct. For example, chimps are on the verge of extinction, right? Right. They harbor a, a simian immunodeficiency virus, and as soon as the chimps are gone, so will the infection. Well, and something like 90% of all species that have ever existed in the history of the world are now extinct. So this is, a, this is not an uncommon event. Good point, yeah. yeah so the, that's part of the story, Daniela, but uh, it's a great question. That brings us to our science podcast of the week. And I was listening to many podcasts this week, and uh, I like the Mr. Science Show by Mark West, MrScienceShow.com. It's a nicely produced podcast, a broad swath of science, not just microbiology or virology, but all aspects of science. The last episode was on global warming, for example, and very nice to listen to, not too long, and well done. So we'll put a link in the uh, show notes for that. I actually um, used to I, I listened to that a few times a number of years ago when it was on the radio on China Radio International. That's on right. Wave. That's right. I saw that on the website originally on China Radio International. So check it out. We like to we like to promote other uh, science podcasts because that's uh, how you get to learn about them. Um, I should point out that we are now a member of another science podcast network called ProMed Network, which is a site for medical and health programming producers to share their shows uh, on science. So check it out. We'll put a link in the show notes. You might find some other podcasts you like. And Alan, you had a great choice for the Science Book of the Week. The Science Book of the Week, I... I um saw that you hadn't cited this one yet, but it's interesting. I interview a lot of scientists for my, my work as a journalist, um, and uh, it, it's amazing to me how often this book comes up, Sinclair Lewis's Aerosmith. Um, and this is uh, not a new book. i <laughs> been around for quite a few decades. Uh, Sinclair Lewis won a – I think he won a Pulitzer Prize for this, and he won a Nobel Prize for another novel of his um, – but uh, this is a this is a, an absolutely classic 
story of of a scientist, a, a scientific researcher, uh, in fact, an infectious disease researcher, um, and the uh, the sacrifices that he makes in pursuing his science. Um, and uh, I thought uh, might be interesting to point people, you know, people who've read the book might find this interesting, and those who haven't might also enjoy it. Uh, you can actually listen to a radio show. Um, not a not not an audio book. It's not just somebody sitting and reading it. It's an actual radio dramatization from the good old days of uh, of radio shows. Um, and this one was uh, aired as part of the Campbell Playhouse radio show, uh, sponsored or featuring Orson Welles. So you can go to the Internet Archive and download that MP3 for free and listen to an old-time radio version of Aerosmith. It is, it is somewhat abridged from the novel. They took out a couple of plot lines, but it's, um, it's a really, really well-done radio show, and I think it's a, a very fun way to enjoy this book. Yeah, we'll put a link to that uh, in the show notes. I also happen, I happen to have a copy of this book in my office. I, uh, I remember reading it years ago. My copy is quite uh, dog-eared, and it's actually um, my mother's copy. My mother was an English teacher, a high school English teacher, oh. and she taught this every year, and I have her marked-up copy with all her notes in it, <laughs> you know, everything marked up, questions to ask the students in the margins, and things underlined, exclamation points. Oh, great. And it's really, really wonderful. Let me just share... Um, one little passage here. So he was in the university and he wanted to work with uh, a fellow by the name of Max Gottlieb. And uh, he wanted to be a bacteriologist. So um, Gottlieb, he goes to visit Gottlieb. And uh, he says, Gottlieb says, no, you're too young. Come back next year. And uh, Aerosmith says, but honestly, with my chemistry, have you taken physical chemistry? No, sir, but I did pretty well in organic. Organic chemistry, puzzle chemistry, stink chemistry, drugstore chemistry. Physical chemistry is power. It is exactness. It is life. But organic chemistry, that is a trade for pot washers. Nah, you're too young. Come back in a year. <laughs> yes. Great book. Great choice. Uh, so, guys, check it out. Um, you'll you'll love it. It's, uh, it was, I think, published in 1924, but... It still resonates today, and if you're interested in research of any kind, absolutely read it. No doubt. Yeah, as I say, it, it comes up uh, just spontaneously. Every now and then, somebody I'm interviewing will say, oh, and have you read Aerosmith? And it's just, it's funny that this keeps coming up. Uh, great pick, Alan. Very good job. Anything else you'd like to interject before we stop? No, I think uh, I think we've filled uh, filled and or wasted most of an hour and a quarter for the the listeners today. Um, we, it's a long show, but hope you enjoyed it. Uh, remember, send your questions to twiv at twiv TV. We uh, really enjoy receiving them, and we're happy to be corrected, and uh, we're happy to answer your questions. You've been listening to this week in virology. Thanks for joining us. See you next week. Yeah.